doing this through this platform, so I am um, wary that things can happen, but that's uh, the unpredictability of the online new life that we are all into. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share with you a PowerPoint. I hope you can all see it. Yes. Which somehow, okay, great. Mm. Um, which outlines the kind of philosophy idea behind this MA program, which I convene. Um, to tell you a little bit about me, I am. Uh, my name is Ruba Saleh. I am uh, the convener of the May program in migration and diaspora studies at SOAS. I was for a long time a member of the Department of Gender Studies, and I moved to the Department of Anthropology three years ago. But my, I am an anthropologist by training. Um, my work has focused mainly on migration for the first 10 years of my career, academic career. I was a migration scholar predominantly working on Moroccan communities in the south and Europe and their transnational lives across Morocco and Italy. Um, in the, the last kind of 10 years of my life, I moved on to the study of refugees and I'm predominantly doing an ethnography of Palestinian refugees um, scattered across uh, a multiplicity of countries in the region uh, and I'm looking at issues of political imaginaries and uh, political agency among the so-called bare lives or the, 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 the dispossessed. So I'm looking at the relationship between camps and cities, I'm looking at how refugees themselves are articulating vision for a radical rethinking of the relationship between state and society. And I'm really doing an ethnography of what it means for them to be human and to be politically active. So um, this is just a little bit about myself. Um, so what, what we do in this MA program, the MA program obviously uh, is um, one year long as most of our MA programs. Um, the philosophy behind it is to look at migration as a diagnostic of power. So instead of looking at migration as a phenomenon as a self-containment phenomenon on and of itself, which of course we do in the various sessions, but the philosophy and epistemology of the program really espouses the idea that migration is a way to look and to understand power. And so the various ways in which power operates across history, societies, geographies, um, and societies. Um, so, um, um, the, the, the program is very interdisciplinary, so though it is located um, physically and um, scientifically, let's say, in the anthropology department, it draws upon a variety of disciplines from political theory to anthropology um, to uh, sociology to cultural studies and post-colonial post studies. Um, as I said, the main idea is to or the bulk of, of, of the program really aims to critically assess migration theories, um, representations of, uh, of migration in contemporary times. Um, so critically engage with notions such as mass migration. What does it mean to call migration or to use the metaphor of the mass when it comes to uh, mobility and, and migratory flows today? Uh, what, does, what does it mean to use the notion of a crisis when it comes to understanding the emergence of uh, <clears throat> the so-called migration, my, uh, refugee crisis around around the world. So we really want to look at criti really critically at the ways in which ideas or mainstream ideas around what migration, mobility, and, and diasporas um, are about, and the semantics, um, the, the the political <coughs> take uh, uh, behind the semantic of these um, understanding. The course looks at both migration, from the title, you obviously fear that, migration and diasporas. But in a way, for, for the past few years, we have organized the course in a way that the first term uh, looks at migration and the second term looks more in depth into uh, the diaspora. And the reason is that a lot of the times the literature are quite different. So the literature on migration is very much focused on mobilities, on, on movements, on uh, regimes um, of, of, of migration, of control and management of governmentality, on borders, whereas the literature on diaspora is much more often focusing on cultural resistance, on identities, on home, home in desires, issues of belonging, issues of aspirations, is, issues of 
um, everyday life. Um, so as the, the slide itself kind of hints at, we are um, really intersecting post-colonial theories uh, which focus on religions and cultural identities of diasporas, their, as, I, as I said already, their homing practices, their desires, um, with, uh, with the focus on the control of these, um, of these, of, of otherness, let's call it like that. Um, so, um, as I said, the, the MA program is very interdisciplinary, so we, but, but I do have a very predominant kind of um, interest in in having students reading ethnographies which account for uh, the everyday experience of of being in transit of being a mobile person or a mobile community um, so um, a very important uh, um, aspect of the migration and its core module which is called Afghan and Asian diasporas in the contemporary world um, is to also challenge the contemporary presentism of migration studies by looking at historical context. So, uh, in other words, um, it is really very common to kind of think that migration is a new phenomenon, or as many colleagues of mine who have written about the topic have a lot of the times defined it as the new age or the new era of migration. So we kind of take issue with this presentism and we juxtapose contemporary mobilities and contemporary migratory movements uh, with, um, uh, with historical migratory movements to understand what is new. Is it about uh, the intensity? Is it about globalization, which provides the new context uh, in which migration is happening? Although, of course, with COVID-19, globalization <laughs> will have to be rethought. Um, so what is new about the new era of migration? Uh, so we kind of juxtapose visually, but also ethnographically, um, the history of migration of the slave trade uh, with, the with, with the contemporary movements um, to see again what is new, what is different, what is that makes this era as more um, prone to be seen as, as, as the age of migration, as the title of a famous book uh, recalls it. Um, we also um, kind of foreground the idea that migration is not to be given for granted. What migration means across different communities, across histories, across times and spaces differ. So the course is really interested in also establishing comparative um, understandings of what people on the move actually think that migration is about. Uh, so not only from a top-down approach, but really actually exposing um, the, um, the understanding that peoples and communities have of their way of moving around the world or within their local or national contexts. Um, so again, juxtaposing movements that we are used to be seeing in these contemporary times, masses of, ref of refugee communities moving from war-torn countries with uh, this light, this light that has been just shown two minutes ago, with other types of, move, of movements from this is a picture from India partition in 1948. Um, so uh, basically, the, the idea is to kind of interrogate rather than take for granted the notion of of, of migration itself, and 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 this is is going to be done by looking at different types of historical and contemporary types of types of, of mobilities. Um, obviously, one quintessential element of this program is to foreground migration with empire. And so the issue of how the various empire formations have uh, been inextricably um, linked to contemporary uh, movements is very important in the program. Uh, in, the, in this country, we have been just um, exposed to a, what, what has been denoted as the candle of the Windrush generation. Um, so this is a picture that records that particular historical moment. But obviously, there are many other instances where the importance of empire emerges. And once again, the importance of juxtaposing. And we use here the metaphor of the, of the as you can recognize, one picture is from the slave trade. The other picture is the is, is very recent picture of um, refugees being carried on a dinghy across the Mediterranean. So again, the kind of 
grasping of the continuities and discontinuities of historical experiences of mobility um, as they are anchored in liberal economic regimes today. Um, a little bit about the, um, the way in which the course is organized. Uh, so the, the course is organized um, in, um, in term one, uh, you share the kind of lecture room with students from across the school. The, um, so since this is a core course for the students taking the MA program in migration management, but it is also an option for other uh, MA programs and also for um, third year um, BA students. So usually we have a big lecture room with, um, depending on every year, 100, 130, 80, depending on, on each year, students. And um, so it's a kind of classic lecture kind of type of um, uh, interaction. But you also are divided into smaller groups in tutorials. So every group is of, every tutorial is not more than 10 students in each one. And these are usually facilitated by myself and other teaching collaborators that are usually third or fourth year PhD students or teaching fellows. Uh, in term two, the, uh, the delivery of the course changes drastically. We are organized in seminar type of work. We have two hour small seminar um, uh, work um, that we carry out. And it's much more interactive. It is much more uh, down to you, um, the kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there facilitating the discussion and conversation, but it's much more intense the way in which the interaction take place, uh, takes place, and it is much more about reading and discussing uh, and dividing groups. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, I can. Yes? I, I, excuse um, me? Yes? Can I say something? Yes, Actually, sure. I hear some noise, so I think some people turn on their mic, so can, can you turn off the mic? Thank you. Can you all turn off your mics? Yeah? Okay, brilliant. I think everyone okay. has turned them off. Okay, brilliant. I, I can see from my yeah. screen that uh, most microphones are off now, so I hope that okay. the sound is better Thank now. You. Yeah, sound is better. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. So I was just um, going to say that in term two, the work is much more seminarial, and so it's um, more <clears throat> organized more around um, um, small groups doing work together. Uh, we we um, make use of vi visuals, um, films, videos, um, group discussions. Uh, we discuss um, news, um, the way in which migration um, emerges as topic in everyday um, political and, and social um, contexts and so on and so forth. Of course, you have still a very dense and thick reading list from which you have to draw um, to, to organize your um, workload for the week. But um, it's, it's very different from term one where it's kind of a classic lecture with an audience kind of um, delivery. Um, we are uh, part of the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies at SOAS, which runs a weekly seminar, uh, usually on Wednesdays from 5 to 7. This is a very nice opportunity to, um, to attend um, a wide setting with uh, usually very interesting scholars coming to present their work. It's one of the contexts where you are able to interact with people working and studying and researching migration, but also with activists, with uh, um, all kinds of people um, involved in migration societies at SOAS. So it's kind of the larger hub where you will see and meet people who are working, studying or interested in migration across the school and beyond. Um, and this is usually on, um, on Wednesdays. Um, we have two new courses in the MA. Uh, one is a course that has started this year, which has been really extremely, extremely successful. Um, and it's called From Theory to Practice and Back, Work Placements in Migration Research. So you'll be placed, those of you who choose this course as an option, which will run again for the second year next year in term two, um, will be uh, placed in um, uh, organizations working in fields as diverse as the arts, uh, migrant support centers, 
um, migration, um, legal protection, um, asylum seekers, um, organizations supporting asylum seekers in the process of applying for asylum, um, and many other different types of organizations. Uh, also, more research-based organizations are involved with us. So usually, uh, you sign up for this course in uh, October, November, and we try to allocate you to in your preferred um, or first choice organization, if possible. Um, there is no coursework or no class for this course. It's entirely work placement based and internship based. But we do have like fortnight sessions where we gather together to discuss the ethical uh, dimensions of the work you're doing, the, the hurdles, the hindrances, or just to share the experiences that you are having and to keep um, each other in the loop of what, uh, what has been happening. And it's been really, really a nice experience so far. Um, a lot of students care, are carrying on, uh, their, um, carrying on their placement beyond, beyond the deadline, um, which is like kind of the end of March, because they got really interested in the work they've been doing or because they want to finish up some stuff. Um, so it's very, so beside the requirements, the specific requirements of the course, actually everyone then is, is really welcome to, to carry on the conversation with the organization that they've been placed in um, and so it's very flexible. Um, the, the assessments for this course are also quite interesting in the sense that you don't have like a classic assessment based on an essay or an exam, but you, you are required to write um, a self-reflexive diary about your experience and about what it meant for you to bridge this theory with this practice. Um, one of the um, one of the things that I've been really experiencing as someone has been teaching migration for a long time, especially at SOAS, is that students come from, I mean, one of the exciting aspects of SOAS is that students come from across the, the world. So you have the world really in a classroom. Um, there are very different expectations about uh, what um, their studies will be equipping students with, but mainly, there is a lot of commitment and a lot of um, interest in theories. And once you obviously go out in the, in, in, in the field and start to applying these theories, you kind of encounter the first, um, the first problem or the first hindrance. Similarly, a lot of friends and colleagues who have been practitioners in the field of migration and diaspora um, do complain about the fact that they are so immersed into their everyday work that they don't have time anymore to think. So in a way, this course offers an opportunity to, to bridge these two fields of theory, of, of thinking, of thinking of migration in abstract terms through, um, through theory and ethnographies with um, hands-in kind of, hands-in approach. Um, we also have a new course which will run for the first time next year, um, which is called Anthropology and Race in the Global Context. And this came out of the need to um, address what I feel is increasingly a gap for a lot of students who haven't been, as I said, since this MA is open to students who come from a variety of different backgrounds, a lot of students haven't been exposed to the significance of race and um, racialized processes um, in, um, in, in issues of migration and beyond. So this course has been really thought as a way to, uh, to offer um, an in-depth understanding of how all kinds of processes are racialized, how whiteness features centrally in, um, in a lot of disciplines. And so it is uh, going to be an option offered to all of you in this master program, um, which kind of equips you with a um, more sophisticated theoretical and empirical lens to understand um, even your own positionalities as people are interested in, in potentially in the future working within this field of, of migration and diaspora. Um, the London in Motion is a very interesting workshop that we've been offering for the past two years. I'm not entirely sure whether it will run next year, so um, I'm giving it to you with a um, caveat that it might not be running, but it has been a very interesting uh, laboratory where we offer students the opportunity to produce their own um, doctorates. 
which are shot uh, at the London, uh, International, London International Documentary Festival in London and are run by the director of the festival. And usually um, they entail um, working in groups around filming or um, delivering an idea of what urban London or migration in an urban context, particularly London, since we are all operating in London, um, what does it mean to, to render this, um, um, let's say, cosmopolitanism or mobility that London is cross-cut by? through images and the documentaries have been have been very interesting very ethnographic in nature focusing on parks on coffee shops on streets on areas of london that are particularly diverse and plural um, as i mentioned earlier um, SOAS is home to a multiple uh, set of societies and groups um, organized by students and not only um, so you have an opportunity to engage, if you want to, with um, a lot of a, a lot of very interesting activist and advocacy work that is uh, being, or, as I said, organized by uh, students and staff. What two such organizations are? The SOAS Goes to Calais Group and the SOAS Nice Society. Um, and uh, obviously, beyond that, there is a lot going on at SOAS with regard to um, all kinds of issues in relation to migration, um, BME um, communities, minorities, and so on and so forth. Um, I'll just move um, towards um, giving you a kind of more, um, someone is ringing my bell, so I've been a little bit distracted. <laughs> So anyway, what I want to do next is to share with you what the course, the core course, African and Asian diasporas in the contemporary world has looked like this year. There is likely to be a little bit of shifting and changes and refurbishing as I do every year, update my syllabus. But uh, this is what uh, more or less, this is more or less kind of the kind of sessions that we have been covering um, the con this contemporary uh, academic year. So migration theories, the colonized, so sorry, uh, one cave. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the SOAS system or the University of London systems. For those of you who are not, we are working with ter two ter three terms, term one, two, and three. Term one is um, composed of 10 of teaching um, interrupted by a reading week where you have time to go deeper in or catch up catch your breath because it's a very intense program. The same goes for term two, 10 um, sessions with um, one reading week in the middle. And term three is the term where you are more um, engaged with exams, with uh, handling essays, and where you start thinking about your final dissertation. So the sessions of term one this year were mainly focusing on migration theories on what does, what does it mean to actually think about migration and how do we decolonize the knowledge power around migration. Uh, for those of you who are familiar already with a little bit of migration theories, you would know that for many, many years before this epoch became defined as the age of migration and a lot of interest in migration emerged, migration was really the the field of mainly geographers who were developing theories from within a very neoliberal or liberal understanding of push and pull, push and pull, push and pull factors. So, um, and it was mainly studied through the lens of migration from the south to the north of the world. So, we want to kind of first of all question this whole apparatus of knowledge production and to focus our attention on what it means to decolonize this knowledge. Uh, migration in historical context is very crucial, as I mentioned earlier. We also want to, um, or we have been actually uh, very much taking issue with uh, the paradigms um, of sedentarism versus mobility. There is an overemphasis on mobility sometimes in the literature, or there is an overemphasis on sedentarism as the main, as the norm, let's say. And these are epistemologies that are usually rooted in Western thinking. So we want to engage with uh, the politics of this knowledge production and the politics of 
um, the understanding of humanity in terms of these two mainstream paradigms, sedentarism versus mobility. Uh, we also take issue or engage critically with the understanding of um, migration as either being voluntary or, or forced. Um, and so we look at ethnographies where the difference between or, or, or the boundary between voluntary versus forced migration or refugees becomes very blurred. Um, we then engage with the paradigm of transnationalism, with issues of homemaking, and how sovereignty is grappling with homes that are increasingly made up of multiplicity of spaces and locales. Um, we also pay a lot of attention to borderlands and the relationship between bodies and borders through, again, a thorough engagement of, with ethnographies and also ethnographies of scholars who have been migrants or refugees themselves who have written extremely powerful and poignant books that we make use of in our course, uh, where the uh, experience of bodies crossing borders become the center of our attention. We also think of migration as a very important lens through which to understand what, what is humanity, who is human. Um, and so the focus on biopolitics, on governmentality of movements, of mig on migration regimes, or the what we call the management of of movement or of migration flows. I am, as a scholar, particularly interested in issues of um, temporalities. So, as you know, for for a lot of people, especially in the global south what has been kind of considered as a momentary interruption of a normal life, that is to say, the movement or the crossing or the detention in a, in a, in, in a, in a, in a detention center or in a camp, has actually unfolded as the reality of their life for generations, the horizon of the life for generations. So I'm interested in sharing with you my research about weighthood, about uh, migration as um, as that kind of experience through which we understand um, what happens in this protracted weighthood as a lot of communities, um, particularly in the global south, but not only, um, have been waiting for, for generations for something to happen or to resume. So life is life in waiting. Um, and the same is, I think, valid for a lot of um, communities and, and, and subjects who, who spend their lives in waiting or in wait, waiting for the right permission to come, waiting for their documents to be regularized, waiting for, um, waiting to escape from a detention center, waiting for a better living condition and so on and so forth. We also get uh, intimate citizenship or forms of um, um, claims of rights that are linked to the private sphere of life, but also at the ways in, we look at the ways in which the notion of sort of what we call intimate relationships that we, we, we used to think about in terms of the private sphere of our homes become politicized or have become um, very much part, of, part and parcel of the way in which the state um, intervenes in our, in our lives. Um, if one one such example, I mean, there are two such examples that can be mentioned here. One is the the idea of domestic workers whose whose work is um, entails that they carry um, um, intimate lives across borders. They share intimate relations um, across techno thanks through technologies that allow them to keep a sense of a family. So this is one context where the public and the private sphere become very blurred. Um, but another example of intimate citizenship is that where the state heavily intervenes in your intimate life in order to assess if you are an asylum seeker applying for asylum in order to assess whether you are truly in love with that particular person, truly engaged, truly um, um, accountable in your, um, in, your, in your application as to whether you are um in a real relationship with someone or in a real or whether you have really your body has been really 
uh, traumatized by injuries or by scars due to war, um, violence and conflict, etc. So this kind of penetration of the state into the intimate realm of your body, your life, yourself, is something that has become very prominent, both in real life and in, in the scholarship uh, that we look at. And finally, we have an open debate where we kind of in world without borders or border, borderless um, world and we we kind of divide into two groups and we we take issue with um, different ideas of what that would entail. Um, term two and I'm getting towards the end of my talk and I'll let you then ask any questions you may want to have to ask. Term two um, moves drastically um, towards um, diasporas. Um, so whereas term one, as you have noticed, was much more geared towards understanding of migration in terms of movements and mobilities and borders and so on, term two is much more geared towards the understanding of diaspora community lives, um, but also how the liberal state um, manages the, its, uh, its own anxiety towards the towards difference or towards plurality, plurality toward embodied, um, embodied um, um, diversity. So um, we foreground the role of emotions. A lot of the times there is a sense in which migration is discussed uh, in the public as through, uh, we kind of think that the, the one way to address the fears that um, have been so prominent in the past decade with the proliferation of right wing and populist movements mobilizing these fears around migration as a way to capitalize on their um, electorate and so on. Um, so we, we've been kind of trained in our um, lives to think that one way to counteract these fears is to bring facts um, and to sort of produce counter narratives that are based on facts and figures and convincing somehow in the in the in the rational sphere of of or the cognitive sphere of, of communication that migration is not as uh, fearful or is not as big as a as a phenomenon or is not bigger than it used to be and so on and so forth but actually in 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 in, in the second part of this course we actually look at the role of feelings and emotions as um as the um, one of the ways in which we can understand the debate on migration today, which is very much uh, affected as in terms of of what we could call an affective economy. It's the what Ariana Padurai, a well-known anthropologist, called the fear of small numbers. There is a sense in which uh, the narratives and public debate around migration have nothing to do with have nothing to do with facts and figures, but are mainly to do with the mobilization and manipulation of of emotions. And once these emotions are out there, it is difficult to tackle them with facts. So we kind of enter into this whole very fascinating body of work that has been produced on affective, on fearing and feelings, and so on, in the creation of otherness and in the dealing of of migration. We look once again um, at the construction of race, the produ production of whiteness, we look at secularism, multiculturalism, and the way in which, um, in a way, particularly in, in, in Western societies, the Muslim body or the gender Muslim body has been at the core of the ways in which debates around secularism and multiculturalism have um, developed. Um, but it's not only the veil, obviously, if you think about hair and the racialized politics of hair, uh, we find a lot of continuities. Uh, so we, we have a very fascinating session where we talk about hair and the politics of, of race behind hair. We then move on to looking at the political work of diaspora. Um, so what does it mean to look, um, to use diaspora as a heuristic device to stand um, the political uh, or the political predic predicament of refugee communities who who actually want to go home and want to go back to their um, territories from which they were expelled. Uh, so we assess 
the validity of, of diaspora that has been so, um, so much, um, in a way, understood through the lens of deterritorialization, through the lens of um, political resistance or resistance towards reified notions of identity of nation or nationalism and so on and so forth. But we assess, we assess this diasporic field through um, or against the experience of communities um, for whom territories and um, self-determination within a particular context is still very important. We look at uh, transnational politics and how communities um, are increasingly organizing politically across borders. Um, and then finally, we look at the cultural work of diaspora. And so um, we look at the spoken word, at poetry, at diasporic cultures of sense, but also pay particular attention to uh, the importance of food as a way of um, producing meaning and, and making of minorities and communities in, in exile. Um, we look at the potential of other genre other than political theory or ethnography or anthropology. So literature or films in dissolving boundaries. And so um, this is a fascinating session where each come and talks about a novel or a film that has particularly destabilized their own visions or understanding of identities um, or um, issues of belonging or of uh, attachments and so on. Um, finally, and I stop with this last slide, we, um, I spoke initially um, about the epistemical grounding of this MA program. One one aspect that really I find really important is that across the the course we really pay attention to the place of activism in knowledge production. I invite students to to really <clears throat> be very wary of the way in which activism and advocacy produce or produce to produce very important knowledge in this field. And so um, it's an invitation that I, I continuously um, make throughout the year to, um, to validate other types of knowledges that are not um, strictly academic or strictly um, scholar um, and to intertwine them with the kind of work we do in the class. Um, so this is a just a quote from the mayor of Riace, a town in Italy that was um, home to, or that, that became a model um, a couple of years ago in in, a, in the Italian context that was uh, it, um, uh, becoming extremely um, alien or extremely uh, violent, in fact, towards um, the idea of arrival of new migrants or towards existing communities um, in the territory. And so this little town became a model of coexistence. Um, but the mayor of this town was uh, was arrested and exiled, actually. And so I found that he, the, what, what he said um, in the aftermath um, of his um, exile from the town, uh, he was exiled. Um, I mean, there was a glitch that was used against him in the kind of distribution of of um, of work to some charities that was found to be illegal. But actually, the real reason was that this model of coexistence that he promoted in this little village, a village that was depopulated by Italian immigrants and repopulated by refugees, um, was proving to be a threat for the narratives that the, that the very right wing populist um, government in place was trying to promote of migrants as threats, as dangers, and so on. So I find that his um, um, understanding and, and that, that is encapsulated into this quote that I'm going to read is, is very revealing of how activism and advocacy are crucially intertwined with the production of knowledge. Um, so he said, if you have the right to divide the world into Italians and foreigners, obviously, the audience here was the right-wing government, 
I claim the right to divide the world into the dispossessed and oppressed on the one hand and the privileged oppressed on the other. The former are my fellow countrymen and the latter are strangers to me. So you see here how um, kind of familiar tropes around who belongs and who doesn't and who um, is your <laughs> ally are completely reversed in, a, in, a, in what I think is a very interesting, actually, um, way of looking at the phenomenon. So thank you very much for your patience. I hope you have managed to listen and to, to be tuned to the, um, to the talk. I, it, it's, it was very weird for me to talk to myself because I can only see my, my face. Uh, and I'm in my bedroom with no shoes. So this is also the first time that I give a talk by not wearing shoes. Um, so I'll leave it now to you to ask questions. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. I'm Anna from London, if you'd like to know. Uh, your, your course, The Theory of Practice and Back, I think that's what it's called. You, yes. mentioned, you, um, you mentioned the arts in, in the list of things that were involved in it, and I wondered in what, in what way the arts were involved. Yeah, so there is one of, one of the organizations um, is called um, Counterpoints Art, and then we also have another organization and it's um, a very prominent organization in London that uh, organizes uh, or promotes the arts of um, BME um, art artists. Um, and so um, I wanted to actually try and send you a link. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so we have two or three actually organizations that we work with that work actually in the field of art and uh, um, actually decolonizing art even. Um, also very prominent in the... Let me go back to the... Let me see if I can send it. Uh, I don't know how to do this. Ah, here. So this is the link to one of the organizations we work with. Um, Another organization we work with is called 198 London, and we are actually trying to set up another partnership with another organization or another gallery. So basically, yes, the, this is 198 Contemporary Arts and Learning is another uh, gallery or art space that is in Brixton in London that for now I think more than two decades have been engaging with ethnic minorities and um, black and brown communities in London in in promoting their here it is um, have you received can you see yes, them thank you. I can yeah thank yeah you. so th this is the yeah this is the art part of the work placement okay thank you you're welcome <laughs> Yes. Hello. Hello. Sorry. I Hello. Can, can you hear yes, me? Hi. Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. wait a moment. Okay. Um, my name is Hiroaki from Japan. So, uh, I want I want to ask you about our graduation thesis is it okay like about the dissertation I, about the graduation thesis yes okay so i think we will work with some professors about our thesis so can we choose them or we will assign some professor to us no you choose your topic obviously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um Usually towards February, the MA uh, coordinator, we have uh, one of our colleagues uh, covers the role of overseeing all the MA programs and he acts mm -hmm. on behalf of all the MA conveners, students to start thinking about their idea for the dissertation, what we call dissertation, the graduation uh -huh. thesis, dissertation. We call it dissertation, which is worth 60 credits and it's mm -hmm. entirely up to you uh, what topic you choose. Um, obviously, we help you to to think through your topic in terms of kind of guiding you whether to, 
towards whether this topic is feasible, is viable, is, is, is possible to be transformed into a dissertation, if there is enough literature that you can work on or not. But broadly speaking, uh, you, you decide your topic and you also have a chance to, um, to work with other colleagues, professors or lecturers in the department and beyond the department who you think might be well suited to supervise your project. Okay, so that means uh, we cannot choose a professor we work with, isn't it? Yeah, you, you can. So what happens is what I said is that you can choose. You can uh, you are offered the possibility to choose your supervisor for your project. OK, OK. Oh, oh but... there is, yeah. Yeah, that's it. The, the only one one thing I wanted to add is sometimes if like, let's say, 20 students want to work with the same person, there will be, you know, there will be a, a redistribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to avoid that some some of us take on too many students and others um, less, but usually this is um, less common. I mean, usually we all get uh, all students get to work with the person they want to work with, and we have some very some very good specialists. I don't know what you want to work on, but we have mm -hmm. specialists in uh, in various areas of the yeah, world. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, can we talk to meet them? Or uh, actually, I heard some big university cannot have cannot have a time to to uh, consult about our thesis with the prof supervisor. So, yeah. Can we meet a professor of very can. often? No, no. Of course you. So, <coughs> um. First of all, the anthropology department at SOAS is not a huge department, so it's very familiar, it's very, um, we are mainly all located within the same kind of floor and corridor, so you do get to meet everyone. Mm -hmm. We have also weekly migration and diaspora center series. We have a weekly um, seminar that the department um, organizes that all students are mm -hmm. warmly invited to attend so this is another place where you actually meet everyone we mm -hmm. have uh, events <clears throat> but also um, when it comes to your your project your final year you know what you call a graduation dissert what did you call it graduation graduation research project we call it dissertation once you are allocated a supervisor you you start working with them since since more or less March. You have um, usually three, four, one hour long supervision time um, allocated to you with your chosen supervisor. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes? Yes? Hello. Hi. I don't know. I don't. Hi. Can you hear me? I'm Paul. Yes. Yes. Hi, Paul. I can hear. Yeah. You. Oh, wonderful. I wasn't sure. Thank you. I wasn't sure if someone else had raised their hand before me. Um. So thank you. First of all, thank you for the presentation, um, and all the very useful information. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, because I've seen you're also the convener of the, of the two-year version of the masters, the one with the intensive language. Yes. Um. I wanted to ask you. Uh. Maybe to talk a little bit about um, the differences between these two these two programs, which are, if I understand correctly, basically the same program just with the addition of uh, 120 credits of language. Exactly. Um, but uh, maybe because I'm personally, I, I have applied to the one year program, but now uh, I have heard, or maybe you can confirm this. I have heard that uh, it is still possible to switch to the to the two year program if if uh, I would want that. So I'm trying to understand, uh, you know, what the what the pros and the cons are, and if uh, and if I were to do the only the one year program, if it was, if it um, if it still would be possible to have uh, to to have a language course at least like a small a small yeah. one, like a shorter version. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, so I'll, I'll start by answering the second part of your question. So yes, if you want to do it uh, as a one-year program, you always have the possibility to incorporate the study of one language uh, right. as part of your credits. Right. And uh, we offer a variety of languages at SOAR, so you can choose yeah. any of those. Yeah. And I think also, but I, I, 
I'm not entirely 100% certain because things change every year. So I'll have, to check this, I'll have to check this. But usually mm -hmm. you can also, for a small fee, um, take more language provision. Um, okay. So, so if this is if you take the one year version. Right. Um, if you take the two year version, basically it really is, as you mentioned, as you rightly stated, the MA program uh, coupled with one year intensive language, which includes um, the studying abroad component. Right. The uh, summer which, school. The summer school, which usually takes place in, um, sure. in different, depending on which language you, you are uh, oh, okay. studying. Um, this, the language is part of the program is run by the language center. So any question related to the, the provision of the languages, I would urge you to, to right. write directly an email to them. Usually they're very, uh, which language are you interested in? Uh, Arabic. Yeah. So I can send you, if you send me a private email, private, like to my email address, uh, the yes. So yes. I can point you in the right direction who, who could be in touch with about uh, how they organize the language provision, what, how many hours a week and how many exams and all of that, because this is run Wonderful. by. Yeah. OK, but thanks, thanks, but, thanks but, a lot. But basically, you, you kind of merge the, the, the one year MA program with with right. uh, the one year studying of the language across the two years. And um, and it's a very, very popular op like choice. Because yeah. it's, it's yeah, it's really you gain two yeah two two things in in um, and you manage you you can you, you can also have the option to for example think about a dissertation in the country where you're gonna study the language right. and so on and in, you know kind of in, intersect your various interests. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Any other questions? I can't hear. You. Yeah, hi. Hello. Hello. Sorry, hi. one second. Okay, here we go. Hi. Um, thank you also, as as Paul. I appreciate you taking the time to do this and speak with us about this. Um, Pleasure. I did want to continue his question on the two-year program because that is that's the one I'm signed up for as well. Um, for a dissertation, that would be in our second year, is that correct? Yes. So that would be at the end of the second year, okay. And then uh, in terms of the, I also had a question about the from theory to practice and back course. Um, I've looked over some of the options and the different you know, uh, organizations that um, SOAS combines with. Is it, number one, is it possible to uh, to take that course with Like if, if we are doing the two year program, could you, could you do it twice and pair with different organizations? Mm. Good question. I don't think you can because you can't count, you can't take a course two times. Right, okay. Um, you know, like cre credit wise, it wouldn't be possible for you to say, let's say it was another course, like, uh, Anthropology of uh, the Middle East, let's say. You can't take it twice because it's the yeah. same course. In, in 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 real in, in actual terms, it's the real course. But what you can do, and I can see that, of course, now there is the COVID nineteen emergency, and uh, arrangements are, as we speak, being made for these organizations to do some of the provisions online, and it's all an emergency situation. But a lot of our students have continued volunteering. Mm -hmm. So and and they have been with um, some of the organizations that have been um, that have been in touch with um, in in the recent weeks. They they have been very keen on continuing having the students volunteering. Not every organization is. I have to be very honest because some organizations uh, have um, a lot of people volunteering, but some of them really rely on volunteers. So they are really happy to keep. Um, to keep you on. So in other words, 
you can't credit it twice, but you can keep going as long as you want. Right. Okay. No, that, that definitely makes <laughs> sense. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Other questions? Hello? Anna? Hi there, Ruba. Um, Hi. Any Is other questions from our participants? No, I don't have. Anyway, I just wanted to say that if you have any other question that uh, you 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 don't have necessarily now but later some other things come to your mind and you want to ask them you just feel really free to email me at any at any time and i'll have i'll be happy to to answer those we can have also conversations on skype or on whatsapp if you have a particular concern or a particular situation that you want to discuss i'm very happy to be available for those so it doesn't have to be all now So I think if we don't have any other questions, um, we can wrap up. Thank you very much, Ruba. That was a great session. Um, and thanks, Thank everyone, for joining in um, and for your questions. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. We're going to put a recording of this session online. Um, so if you want to refer back to it, it will be there and available for you. Um, but thank you all very much. And I hope you all keep well. And um, thanks for joining. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope to see you next year. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.